Hola and hello everybody. I have a quick um, <laughs> request, which is that we're starting 15 minutes late. So we are actually, the session will go on till 2.15 and we'll have to shorten the, uh, what was a very long coffee break anyway. <laughs> so we won't miss anything. And then we will be back on schedule at 2.30. With that, um, welcome again, everybody. We are on to our afternoon session. I'm Nina Siddiqui from Brack University. I want to thank uh, the organizers, especially Kanchen, for including us in this larger NYU community initiative. Very happy to be here. We've had a day and a half of intense conversation from a variety of disciplinary and ideological locations. We have yet to engage with at least in any depth, the law and constitutional obligations or structures um, in relation to inequality. And that's where this session with Sarah was saying fits in. Um, she's changed, the title of her talk has changed slightly. Let me just announce it <laughs> a lot. Shrinking Spaces and Surging Sentiment, the Impact on Equality Rights in Bangladesh. Now before I introduce Sarah, I wanted to say a few words to situate her talk for those of you who may not be familiar with the Bangladesh context, and I realize in South Asia, even in South Asian studies, we have these blocks you know, that don't necessarily, um, are not necessarily in conversation. Now, the documentary last night powerfully captured the visceral experiential registers that neoliberal forms of inequality can entail. The structural violence, I found, you know, faced by individuals like Shaquille, who are forced into intimacies with the dark social spaces and underground economies of the city, these resonate strongly. Bangladesh also shares with other South Asian countries what we could call a structured blindness to what drives or produces the kind of predicament that Shaquille and others find themselves in, something that the film <coughs> gestured to but really didn't talk about, but that perhaps was not the intention of the film. Like elsewhere, sanitized discourses of development render acceptable um, various kinds of dispossession and accumulation in Bangladesh. And so we have, you know, as the film also reminded us, the overnight eviction drives of hawkers or those sleeping on the sidewalk. We heard about that earlier this morning too. But the planned displacement of indigenous groups to build eco parks. Very, very <laughs> ironic, you know. But all of that is in the name of progress, right? Um, basically, the politics of distribution is not on the table when if the development discourse frames ideas of what is the good life and what is moral and just. Certain kinds of conversation are very difficult to have. But I, you know. So these are, I think that these are things that we share um, across South Asia. One thing that is different, I don't know if um, Debraj is gone, but I will say He's gone. He's gone. Economists, <laughs> he's gone. Okay. Okay. So economists are exalted in Bangladesh. I don't know if you would agree with me, but I tend to think that if there is not this, you know, it's very interesting. That's something to talk about. But I want to locate the specificity of Bangladesh within the region, especially because I think transnational capital and politics don't unfold in the same way everywhere. We know that, but I want to just maybe highlight what it's like in Bangladesh, just a couple of things. First of all, there's the so-called Bangladesh paradox. So the development regime in Bangladesh has had some notable successes, and I'd say they're substantive su successes when it comes to things like what the you know, World Bank, what the economists call social and economic indicators, right? Uh, most of you may be familiar with it. So if it, when it comes to maternal and infant mortality rates, universal, primary and secondary school education for girls and boys, fertility and the like, there's really been um, improvement. Rates of inequality, I think, I'm not, you know, I don't know the numbers, I think they're lower than in Pakistan or India. Bangladesh achieved food security several years ago. It apparently has growth rates of 7%. It's still a low income country, so the question is how does having, you know, not having become richer still correlate with this? That, that's not the question I'm going to ask, but that's something to keep in mind. The second thing, and I think Sarah's talk will get to this in various ways, the this kind of development is paired with an increasingly illiberal and authoritarian state. Mm -hmm. One that uses legal provisions quite creatively to censure, police, and close down spaces of dissent. Um, and so, you know, Sarah will talk in much more detail about this. I just want to note that the space between the legal 
and what we might call the just or the moral <coughs> keeps expanding. Or you know, there's a huge, there's an interesting slide and slippage in the use of that. Finally, I want to flag the domestication and depoliticization of social movements that took place in the post Ershad period when there was a military dictatorship, right after parliamentary democracy was reinstituted. This was in part the outcome of an NGOization process that occurred globally in the 1990s, but because of Bangladesh's particular place in the transnational economy, it happened because of its so-called donor dependency, it happened earlier and more intensely, the effects were more intense. So that although we have a few very, what we would, I would call radical um, <coughs> NGOs, movements, on the whole, the NGOization has really depoliticized what sort of what even our you know interests are. Um, th there's that, and there's the earlier decimation of the left. All of this makes it very difficult to raise certain kinds of questions around inequality and redistribution. Um, I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm going to <coughs> now introduce my very dear friend Sarah. It's a very pl uh, great pleasure for me to have her here. We are old collaborators on various things, although collaborator might not be the right term. <laughs> <laughs> not a collaborator, but that's an insight. I'm not even going to go there. Uh, we work together closely on and off. Um, oh dear. Sarah Hussain is a lawyer at the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, a partner in the law firm Dr. Kamal Hussain and Associates, and an honorary executive director of BLAST, Bangladesh Legal Aid and Services Trust. She also does a lot of other things that I don't see here. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, um, okay, I, don't, I won't say too much more. But she played a key role in drafting Bangladesh's first comprehensive legislation on violence against women, which went on to become the law. In 2016, she received the International Women of Courage Award. I'm getting up now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go on. She has some UN, other UN credential that I, don't, I thought would be listed here. But Sarah, it's all yours. You have 30 minutes. Thank you very much. a different talk, as you can see the we subject matter the no, subject matter has changed kind of significantly. Right. Right. Any good? Yeah. International Mother Language Day now, which celebrates the rights to linguistic and cultural diversity. This, this is a day that originates from and commemorates a moment which is significant in our nationalist history in Bangladesh. And in fact, it's been identified as really marking the start of the history of the liberation of the Bengali people, with language, culture, and ethnicity being seen as the defining markers of national identity. And prior to that, as the basis for exclusion and discrimination when it was so part of the Pakistan state. The shift from the national to the international and the universalization of the particular has created in its turn new opportunities to assert a version of Bangladesh citizenship that is more open to acknowledging ethnic and linguistic diversity and therefore to furthering the right to equality. I want to focus my remarks today on this tension between the different promises and notions of citizenship that are reflected and recognized in our constitution and our laws and how these impact on ideas and practices of equality and in particular in relation to equal protection of the law and the right to personal security and liberty. Thanks. <clears throat> I'll start with just setting the context a little bit for those of you uh, who are not so familiar with, with um, the Bangladesh legal framework, and I hope the rest of you will bear with me a bit through this. And then I'll look at some of the examples of, uh, examples of legislation, particularly legislation that uh, restricts certain kinds of speech around issues to do with religion and religious sentiment in particular. But I'll also look at the kind of legislation that, um, particularly a lot of the new post independence <coughs> legislation that restricts speech, which is critical of the state. And then after setting that, I will look at a few different examples. Um, so just starting with the Constitution, uh, this poster will be familiar to many of you who've, um, from the Liberation War period. 
um, it really foregrounds the fact that uh, there was a notion of, uh, of Bengali identity, the Bengali people, and a real commitment to eliminating discrimination based on religion. Uh, that commitment that was, uh, that, that sort of fueled so much of the, the liberation struggle and uh, the movement prior to that found space inside the Constitution in terms of commitment to eliminating discrimination on grounds including of religion. A secularism was also clearly, uh, clearly found space within the Constitution in 1972. Freedom of religion, freedom of expression guarantees were also in place. And making the, making the secularism, uh, the commitment to secularism even stronger, there was a ban on any kind of political, on the formation of political parties based on religion. But in contrast to the strength of the protections against religious discrimination, of course the homogeneity of the, of the Bengali nation was further asserted. So Bengali was identified as the national culture, constitution protected, citizenship was defined as Bengali citizenship, and Bangla was uh, identified as the national language. <coughs> we moved quite far from, from the constitution of 1972 today, almost 45 years on from when it was adopted. Uh, we still have quite a few bits of it. I'm not going to go through all the details of when things dropped out because of amendments and when they got back in through, through court processes. But at the moment where we stand, the secularism is still a part of the Constitution. The ban on abuse of religion for political purposes, the prohibition of giving political status to any religion is still in the Constitution. Uh, the right to equality and non-discrimination is there. The right to affirmative, me uh, affirmative action measures is the, are there. Uh, freedom of religion and freedom of expression are untouched since 72. But what are the accretions that we've had in the meantime? Probably the most significant one is that Islam is now the state religion. First brought in in 1988 by a military dictator, but then rather tragically uh, reasserted by a democratically elected government with a vast majority at that point, uh, and a vast elected majority. Uh, with this making of Islam as the state religion, we also have a new addition. Um, that equal status and equal rights is granted uh, in the practice of the Hindu, both as Christian and other religions. Uh, citizenship is no longer defined as Bengali citizenship, but Bangladeshi citizenship, which may be seen as giving more space to an assertion of a Bangladeshi Muslim identity as opposed to a, a more purely Bengali non-religiously affiliated identity, but also gives the promise of inclusion and diversity for other ethnicities as well. And as part of that recognition, there's also uh, concrete and specific <coughs> recognition of so-called tribes and minor ethnic groups. I should mention that language is seen as extremely unappreciated by those who are described as minor ethnic groups, who would rather be called Alibashis or indigenous peoples, and that's a, another discussion. Just uh, for a moment to look at what <coughs> happened with the issue of the challenge to Islam of the state religion. As I mentioned, it was, um, this, this uh, amendment came into our constitution in 1988. At that time, it was challenged almost immediately, and, and challenged by uh, a bevy of the great and good, including a former chief justice, former vice chancellors, people who were really seen as, as the secular conscience of the nation. But being strategic, as well as uh, conscientious, they realized that it probably wasn't wise to move that petition at that time in the courts, for fear that there would be a backlash, and they wouldn't win it, and they would get a kind of certification of the change that had already happened. So they held fire. Several of them in the meantime passed away. And then, not just a few years, but many years, 24 years later, uh, that case finally came for a hearing before the Supreme Court. In the meantime, what had propelled this to happen, in the meantime, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which I mentioned earlier, reasserting this provision of Islam as the state religion had come into being. These were challenged uh, and brought before the courts. By this point, these gentlemen that you see on the screen had become fairly active. And uh, their demands included that if Islam, if, if this constitutional amendment were to be struck down, that they would occupy the streets and bring the government down. Um, their slogan, in fact, says, no Islam in the constitution, Islam will be the constitution. So in the face of their burgeoning demands and very vocal demands, uh, the case had a very sudden uh, and whimpering end after this long 24 hour wait. And the court rejected it out of hand without any substantive hearing on the merits on the basis that um, firstly, many of the petitioners had in the meantime passed away. And secondly, the fact that they had been established as an informal body to resist uh, the making of Islam as a state religion, that that body wasn't registered and therefore they had no standing. Um, this, this is kind of an interesting argument because um, as we all know from all of us from South Asia, that our courts are generally rather generous in terms of giving standing rights, except when it doesn't suit them to 
So let's let's go on to the, looking at the legislation and, and the changes that have been made. Um, as you can see from here, um, there's quite a lot of commonality in terms of the legislation across across South Asia, at least across India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So the commonality in terms of our colonial inheritance is, of course, the famous sections on hurt religious sentiment, causing enmity between communities, and allowing the prescription of material which contains such content. But all of the legislation you'll see in green is stuff that we've come up with subsequently in the post-independence period. So we have legislation like the Special Powers Act, and very interestingly, subsequently, the Information Communication Technology Act, which prescribes uh, online speech, which causes hurt to religious sentiment. It doesn't just prescribe it, it imposes far more draconian penalties and far more, far more draconian process for anyone who indulges in such speech. Um, the 15th Amendment, as I said, made Islam as a state religion, but it also said that any criticism or any attempt to reduce confidence um, or reliance on any provision of the Constitution would itself be considered to be an offense amounting to sedition. Um, and we see further, we see this, this whole provision of criminalizing online speech and hate speech essentially is coming through again and again in new now uh, proposed legislation, the Broadcasting Act and the Digital Security Act, which are under consideration. Side by side with this, it's, a, it's important and useful for us to have a look at what kind of speech about the state is also prescribed and criminalized. So again, we see sedition and conspiracy, uh, having in your possession seditious materials, but again, an entire raft of legislation, post-independence re legislation, a ton of it which prescribes online speech, hurting the image of the nation. You'll see the very interesting elision of language, from the language of sedition to the language of hurting the image of the nation. Incredibly, even more subjective language if that were possible. Um, and then, as I said, subverting the confidence, belief, or reliance in the Constitution. Created as a constitutional offense. Maybe it will one day be subject to challenge, but it isn't yet. Um, Again, speech which is critici criticism not only of the Constitution, but going one step further, criticism <coughs> within the constitutional body is also now a penal offense, if, at least if you're a non-governmental organization which receives foreign funds. And we have another bunch of draft legislation which is on the anvil right now, the Draft Citizenship Act, which also penalizes uh, criticism of the Constitution and threatens you with, this sounds a little bit American, threatens you with being uh, stripped of your citizenship if you are not a citizen by birth. <laughs> in such an act. Unfortunately, still draft, and no doubt um, better minds will come to prevail and we we'll see some changes on that. Um, and again, Broadcasting Act, Digital Security Act, similar kinds of provisions. Oh, there's one interesting thing here as well. The Broadcasting Act suggests that it would be an offense if you make statements which don't uphold the ideology of the state. Again, more <laughs> subjectivity. <laughs> and the Draft Digital Security Act has another strong provision that any propaganda or campaign against the spirit of liberation or the father of the nation is also going to be penalized. Again, these are still under consideration. So what we see with these legal protections is they're very broad, very vaguely worded um, restrictions on speech, largely, of course, inconsistent with international human rights law, but in many, respect, uh, in many respects also inconsistent with our own constitutional provisions. But because of arbitrary application of the law and because of the uncertainty, really, about how these would be judicially considered or dealt with, they haven't, by and large, been subjected to any kind of uh, judicial review or constitutional challenge. Side by side, as we see an increasing co-optation of the media or threats to the media that would speak out, again, as Dina mentioned, we see less and less political critique and questioning. There's, there's discourse, but less action. And alongside all of this, of course, the real threat is there of extremist violence, which I'll speak about in a moment. So on the one hand, you have this whole slew of measures that the state can take uh, under the legislation. On the other hand, you have the threat that if you do speak about issues that will uh, be seen as uh, <coughs> incursions on religious sentiment, then you have a much more immediate threat at hand, which is of extreme violence. So in this context, what kind of speech do we see is protected? What is prevented or punished? And how does this impact inequality, particularly in, in the context of uh, religious groups and communities or around equality issues in general? I look at a few examples of asserting equality. Uh, firstly, around gender equality in the family. As we know, again, across the region, uh, we still live with uh, personal laws inherited uh, from the colonial period and largely, at least in Bangladesh, completely unaddressed in terms of reforms with respect to Christian law. No change whatsoever since partition in 1947. As far as Hindu laws are concerned, uh, none of the changes that have been made in India over 60 years ago have happened. The only one we have is an optional Hindu marriage registration act. 
On Muslim law, there are some greater changes that we implement the legislative and judicial reforms in a number of different uh, areas. Um, but again, we see a great deal of hesitancy, a great deal of reluctance in taking on, issue, taking on issues more robustly, which are perceived as possibly um, likely to, again, constitute an incursion on religious sentiment. So at the moment, for example, with the Child Marriage Restraint Act, you would think a relatively simple one to resolve. We have a major exception which has been put into the Act, which it's considered is, it is likely to be there so that it will not step on the toes who, of those who feel that uh, Muslim laws allowing marriage on puberty should be retained and should not be restrained in any way. And we see, again, a reluctance by the judiciary to take on direct constitutional challenges. So when we had our version of Shabani, the courts deferred and said that Parliament should decide this. It's never come before Parliament in the almost 20 years since. A recent public interest case challenging the absence of the divorce rights for Hindu women, even, even those subjected to extreme violence, is again completely stagnating in the courts because nobody wants to take it forward because of the, the risk of, uh, again, the risk of, or the perceived risk of backlash. Um, another issue which has been before the courts and at least constitutes, I think, one step forward. On the issue of violence against women and so-called fatwas issued by uh, traditional dispute resolution bodies, uh, in villages, mostly for breach of social or sexual norms. Uh, the case law we see on this is very interesting, that uh, in, in 2001, the court gave, the High Court gave a Sumoto declaration banning all fatwas. That had a pretty extreme reaction. There was indeed a backlash. There were indeed people on the streets protesting that. The police fired on them, and there were deaths. The case pretty much went to sleep after that. But two self-declared muftis, appeared, filing an appeal, and asserting their right to freedom of expression, including to give and receive fatwas in the context and drawing upon the fact that Islam is the state religion, and saying that that meant that they could interpret the right to freedom of expression, as well as freedom of religion, in the context of, of Islam being there as part and parcel of the Constitution. Uh, this case, again, held fire for almost a decade. And finally, uh, in between, some strategic litigation was undertaken by a group of uh, development and human rights and women's rights organizations, which led to a more measured judgment from the High Court, not deliberating on whether fatwas as such were constitutional or unconstitutional, but noting that they only amount to opinions under our legal system, and holding that extrajudicial penalties given by any body or authority were completely unconstitutional, and constitute a failure to provide a uh, and they also held that the failure to provide a legal response was a breach of the right to equal protection of law. The court also proactively directed the authorities, the police and the local government authorities to take preventive action in cases of any fatwa that, that were reported. Uh, that has somewhat been complied with, but uh, the other direction that they gave to the education ministry to include information on the supremacy of the constitution and fundamental rights in school texts, perhaps less surprisingly, has not been complied with to date. And subsequently, we had a Supreme Court decision which, which supplemented this by stating that, again, reasserting that fatwas are mere opinions, not formally recognized within the Bangladeshi legal system, but they may be issued and they may be received by any person who wishes to receive them in the form of an opinion, and they may only be issued by persons learned in the law. To go on to another issue, one I think many of you will be familiar with from um, the media reporting of the, of the last couple of years. The issue of attacks on writers, teachers, uh, atheists, basically people who criticize orthodoxy, fundamentalism. Uh, what has happened with these cases? Uh, in the vast majority of cases, we have we see that we don't we're not at the end of the road in terms of in terms of investigations and prosecutions. And this incidentally is not a comprehensive set of those who have been decimated in this way. I just want to talk about one particular example, um, and this is around the thing <coughs> of. Um, a young human rights and LGBT rights activist, Drew Hasmanar. Uh, he was killed last year in April 2016. Uh, the immediate, uh, in the days immediately prior to his killing, uh, he had been involved in organizing, with his organization, Rupan, a rally called the Rainbow Rally on Poyla Bulshat, the, the New Year's, uh, Bengali New Year's Day, also celebrated, of course, across the whole of South and Southeast Asia. Uh, this Rainbow Rally, as a sort of blurred image of it here, um, was really a very powerful strategic decision for the organization to take. The procession was not a separate procession. It didn't have separate banners, but it took part as part of the Poyla Bushak rally that is brought out by art college students every year, and which increasingly has been seen as a real kind of 
uh, counterpoint to the increasing assertion of religious identity manifested in religious festivals such as the in particular. But this, this festival, the Poyla Boishat Festival, is inclusive. Inclusive in terms of uh, different communities coming together. Inclusive in terms of being able to breach barriers of faith and belief and non-belief. Um, and Rupan worked closely with uh, the Art College, was part of the procession, to, and took <coughs> part in it. This would have been the third year running. However, a few days before the rally was to take place, threats were received and communicated to them um, through Facebook and informed to them in, not only through the, the Facebook post but also by the police. The police arrived not to uh, provide the Rupan um, rally with. Um, constitutional protection to carry out the rally, as was their right, but to say that they would need to withdraw because the threat levels were too high and they couldn't be contained. Uh, not only was the rally withdrawn by uh, consent and agreement with the Rupan organizers, but several individuals who couldn't uh, be informed in time that uh, the rally wasn't to take place and who had appeared at the rally, possibly dressed in rainbow colors, were detained by the police uh, for the entire day and then outed to their own family members who hadn't previously been aware of, um, um, of their sexual orientation. Uh, subsequent to this, Julius and his, uh, his friend and colleague who were, who were murdered a few days later decided that they would, they would not seek police protection in this situation because they were extremely afraid of the same kind of, situ same kind of situation being visited upon them. Immediately after this, again, uh, not acting in compliance with their constitutional obligations to ensure protection of those who had faced these threats, uh, we, we saw a high level official statement saying homosexuality is against our culture and the proselytizing about homosexuality is also a criminal offense. Um, the, cases of, uh, the cases and the investigations into Julius's murder, as with many of the others, are still continuing. Now, in contrast to these particular cases, uh, which have received an enormous amount of international attention, uh, we see the more, the more, if not daily, the more regular uh, attacks on religious minority communities, particularly on the very poor, and particularly on those who still have land and property. Uh, we've seen repeated attacks of this kind. Um, some, of, some of the more recent ones, just in, in the couple, last couple of years, um, we see these communal attacks and uh, the attacks are fairly extreme, followed by impunity for those who are involved, and victim blaming, so that uh, in several cases, for example, in the case in Ramu, in, uh, in South of Bangladesh, more recently in the case in Nasir Nagar, we see that individuals from the community which is under attack are accused of having made Facebook posts, uh, breached those provisions on online, uh, online uh, speech which is hurting religious sentiment. Um, and taken into custody and not released for weeks, sometimes months on end. At the same time, as these cases proceed very speedily, the prosecution seems to enter a period of stagnation. And with the consequent threat level, there is <coughs> continuing, if not migration, certain huge vulnerability and consideration of the possibility of migration. I want to just end with a couple of quick examples, again, of how exactly these, these controversies, controversies are being whipped up around uh, the issue of hurt religious sentiment is being brought to the front. Uh, one issue currently that uh, I think is hitting the courts hopefully next week is around the changes in school textbooks. Uh, the Hifazat Islami, who were those people that we saw a little earlier on uh, in relation to the constitutional amendment issue, um, had sought changes to the school textbooks, the Bangla textbooks for um, classes 1 to 10. And they had given a list of specific changes that they wanted. It turned out that most of those changes came through. And what's very disturbing about this is, of course, the Hibazis, like every other citizen, have a right to put in their submissions wherever they want and have them considered. But of course, this wasn't considered in any transparent fashion. And the kinds of reasons that were given and are written down for why they wanted these changes, and some of the poems and stories they wanted removed, they felt were against the convictions of the Quran and the Hadith. Some they felt centered around the Hindu deity Gurudha. Some they felt resulted in thousands, probably millions of students <coughs> learning or being exposed to Hinduism. And finally, they were concerned about teaching about the sexual activity of bowels. Uh, and they have succeeded on all these fronts in having this removed. So this may, this may in fact be judicially reviewed soon, we hope. Uh, and a final uh, controversy, which, um, which we are facing at the moment, is this, um, 
Well, I don't know, there may be aesthetic judgments you want to make about the statue, but <laughs> uh, at the moment I think we have to hold those in abeyance, because on principle, of course, we have to support her right now. The Hibazat now, having moved on and I think been emboldened by their textbook victory, are now anxious that this Greek deity on justice should be removed from the Supreme Court premises. I should mention she's a fairly recent arrival. We haven't had her, I think she's only a few months old, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, quite fetching with her sari and the sword and the scales. But this, this is now raging at the moment about whether the statue will be removed or will be removed. So just, just to end, I mean, all of this might give you a suggestion that um, actually we are sort of entering the medieval era and there's no progress in Bangladesh. I hope you know, your preparatory remarks were a you know, fairly clear indication that that is not in fact the situation. And underneath all of this drama, there are many incremental steps being taken to actually put in place substantive equality measures. So we see, for example, um, a draft anti-discrimination legislation, rather peculiarly conceived in that it deals, it states that it's an umbrella legislation, but it deals only at the moment with uh, the rights of Dalits and of Hijras. So uh, the Hijras are not named that. They're called, extremely unfortunately, sexually disabled communities. Um, so again, I think a bit of law that needs quite a lot of thinking. <laughs> But the spirit is a good one. The spirit of trying to address you know, discrimination through legislation, I think, should be applauded. Um, we also have activation, after a long time, of legislation on the return of so-called vested property, which earlier was called enemy property, which effectively is returning property that was expropriated from minority communities, in particular from the Hindu community. <coughs> we also see a number of quite robust and strong judicial decisions coming from the Supreme Court <coughs> on the recognition of custody laws and Adivasi identity. Um, we see another very uh, significant move in terms of uh, reservations at different levels. Reservation of course for freedom fighters and more controversially for their children and grandchildren, but reservations for women in terms of uh, public office education and political participation. Reservations for Adivasi is not named as such, but still in place in Plains and the Hills. Reservations for Dalits, uh, um, and reservations, new reservations, despite there being no constitutional recognition. The reservations for people with disabilities are now in interest as well. And we see alongside this, um, many programs and policies of the kinds we've been talking about for the last couple of days, really uh, intervening in terms of shifting uh, economic equality and social equality on the ground. So stipend programs, again, as Dina mentioned, public sector jobs, increasing visibility, for people from, from marginal communities and from minority communities. So the hope is very much that, that this, this consistent and continuous process um, will of course continue on uh, forward, but the concerns are that uh, while we clearly don't live in a context in which constitutionalism is necessarily the driving force, because we see, we see how the constitutional framework is under threat and the legislative framework is in many ways moving backwards, uh, still we can see that there is at least two steps forward and with every time there's one step back to the law as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. That was wonderful. And you were on time. We might have a minute to spare, but we'll have more, you know, that means we'll have more time for discussion. Um, okay, so the floor is open. Sarah's given us a lot to think about but done it actually in a wonderfully compact kind of way. So, Deja. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have, my question is based on actually many years ago at the ver <coughs> this very conference, there was a presentation about Urdu speakers in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. um, but and because that was, I want to say, that was almost, probably like eight years ago. So I was wondering if you could tell us like, it, you know, because that they were referred to as stranded Pakistanis. Is it possible to pass a microphone on that? Yeah, no. So I'm, d I'm, as I'm asking you about the you category. Of, yeah, yeah, I'm asking about the category of Urdu speakers in Bangladesh and who used to be referred to as stranded Pakistanis. I was curious as to what the situation was regarding that community and um, and and so far in terms of you like the constitutional um, language that is like, recognizing minority. I think minorities, I was wondering if language was still part of it or not part of it. Do you want to take some questions? Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Paula. <laughs> um, so I was curious, thank you, that was a perfectly designed talk. <laughs> uh, I, I had a question about the, when you were going through the legal reform, so many of the new laws have to do with media, information, technologies, etc. And so much of what we hear about this kind of violence 
Thank you. This was a. Uh, Can you stand up so that sure, we can sure, sure. have a. Um, thank you for your fantastic um, uh, talk. And I want to ask something actually that builds very directly on what Paula just asked, which is um, <coughs> so I'm thinking about the whole digital Bangladesh um, makeover initiative, the investment of the government um, into not just e governance, but the in all of the things that go along with it, like a modern ideas of modernity, um, but specifically um, investing in digital uh, media to uh, not just conduct government, but to communicate with citizens. So in in, um, in effect, and kind of district magistrates and um, SPs having been instructed to have face Facebook pages mm -hmm. to publicize their action, that any citizen can access the government, government officials via these, uh, these media. So I was wondering how we would uh, place an enterprise like the uh, Digital Bangladesh, or making the Bangladesh uh, a digital public sphere, so to speak, speak with these kinds of legislation that um, very clearly demarcate and target uh, online communication. How do we think about those together? And maybe just one more question, Asra. Um, <coughs> I had actually two questions. One was uh, that uh, Nina talked about uh, you know, the, the whole context of NGOs in Bangladesh. And when we look at uh, NGOs in Bangladesh, we find them very, very neoliberal mm -hmm. in their orientation, very market-oriented. And you have the <laughs> honor of uh, the Nobel Prize, uh, Dr. Yunus, <laughs> who in many of our circles where we really critique, as in the morning, the whole issue of microfinance and then this income support programs and so on and so forth are very much a push of the capitalist uh, systems into the informal sector.